Good evening and welcome to the presentation of the University of Michigan's 26th Wallenberg Medal. My name is John Godfrey and I am chair of the Wallenberg Executive Committee. And I have a reminder that if you have a question for our medalists, be sure to write it on one of the uh, cards that have been distributed and pass it along the aisles to, the, uh, to the, uh, one of the ushers and they'll get it to us. In 1934, Raoul Wallenberg was in his last year as an architecture student here at the University of Michigan. He excelled in his studies and prized the companionship of many friends. He had found a university that gave him freedom to find his own path. He savored his independence, especially in the summers when he traveled the roads from New York to California, usually by hitchhiking. It was a time of great movement across the United States. Sharecroppers and their families were fleeing north to Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Chicago, escaping bonded poverty and the terror of lynchings. Farmers from Kansas, Oklahoma, and East Texas, uprooted by the terrible winds of the Dust Bowl, took to the road, moving westward to find a new life. Wallenberg explored the roads Americans took as he witnessed this great upheaval. We know from the many letters he wrote home to his family in Sweden that he treasured his time at this university. As graduation neared, he wrote his mother, I feel so at home in my little Ann Arbor that I am beginning to sink roots and have a hard time imagining having to, having to leave, but I am not very useful here. Only 10 short years later, Raoul Wallenberg found himself on a different road. He was a diplomatic representative of the Swedish government, which had remained neutral during World War II. On November 22nd in 1944, he drove from Budapest to the town of Hegia Salom, which lay on the border between Hungary and Austria. During the previous week, 50,000 people from Budapest's Jewish community had endured a forced march along the road he now traveled. Adolf Eichmann, senior officer of the German SS and a principal organizer of the Holocaust, had ordered this deadly trek. Over a distance of 110 miles, as he traveled, Wallenberg passed the bodies of thousands who had died from cold, hunger, exhaustion, and disease, many murdered when they were unable to go on. At the train station in Hegia Salom, he found German troops and Hungarian fascist militia shoving people into boxcars that would take them to death camps. Wallenberg pressed Swedish documents into the hands of as many of those as he could reach. He argued that these men, women, and children were under Swedish protection and could not be removed. This time, Wallenberg and his colleagues were only able to rescue a few dozen from among as many as 3,000 persons. But he persisted, returning to Budapest, which was descending into fire, blood, and ash in one of the longest sieges and bloodiest battles of the Second World War. Raoul Wallenberg was the central figure in the epic struggle to save the Jewish community of Budapest. He was not alone. From the clipped and concise diplomatic record, we know that other emissaries from Sweden, as well as from Switzerland, Spain, Italy, and the Vatican, shared in this effort. But it was Wallenberg's fierce and driven persistence, his cunning and his determination, that forged these efforts into a citywide community of resistance. He created a system of safe houses and distributed documents that conferred on their bearers the slender hope of diplomatic protection by neutral countries. His network of young Jewish runners used rooftops, alleys, and sewers to avoid German troops and murderous Hungarian fascist gangs. One of those couriers who brought messages, documents, food, and medicine to those in hiding was 16-year-old Vilmos Bosch. In 2006, William Bosch received the Wallenberg Medal here in Rackham Auditorium. We know from the witness of, those, witness of those who endured in Budapest cellars that in these desperate days, the name Wallenberg represented hope against all odds. In the end, Wallenberg himself disappeared. But rising from among, among the blood and the ashes and against the despair of the murders committed along the road to Hagia Salom and across Budapest, nearly 100,000 people survived from the last and the largest Jewish community in Europe. As he had written his mother 10 years earlier from here in Ann Arbor, <clears throat> Wallenberg wanted to be useful. His legacy for us is the conviction that one person can make a difference and that courage is the indispensable civic virtue. He and the others who stood with him 
many of whom were very young when summoned to this challenge that lies at the furthest edge of our capacity to imagine, remained faithful to the enduring strength of this conviction. Tonight, in this, in his beloved university, we honor his memory and recognize those who stand with Raoul Wallenberg. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Mark Schlissel, president of the University of Michigan, who will introduce the 26th recipients of the Wallenberg Medal. Uh, uh, thanks very much, John, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome two of the Michigan Board of Regents who are here this evening, uh, Regent Kathy White and Regent Michael Beam. Uh, It's a great honor to be here to present the 26th Wallenberg Medal to tonight's distinguished honorees. I especially thank the members of the Wallenberg Committee and all those who have established and now carry forward the proud Wallenberg legacy at the University of Michigan. The values we uphold at the University of Michigan in our community include a deep commitment to improving our society, to promoting peace, seeking justice, and leading profound positive change in our world. Our courageous alumnus, Raoul Wallenberg, exemplifies these ideals in full measure. The lives he saved and the generations he continues to inspire are lasting reminders of one of our most closely held values, one that's projected right behind me, that one person can make a difference. Celebrating Wallenberg's legacy is one of the proudest and most solemn traditions here at the University of Michigan. Thanks to the work of many people here this evening, our university is advancing student learning beyond the classroom through the Wallenberg Fellows and the students who study and serve with help from our International Summer Travel Awards. These opportunities are made possible by individuals who have contributed to the Wallenberg Endowment over the last three decades. I applaud their generosity and their vision for recognizing the importance of these types of engaged learning experiences for our students. Our honorees tonight have demonstrated a level of engagement that is so desperately needed in our society. The US Centers for Disease Control report that gun deaths are the second leading cause of fatalities for children in our nation. And gun violence is the number one leading cause of death among African American children. Too often, we're reminded by tragedy of the need for solutions to gun violence. Last month in Kentucky, a shooter reportedly tried to enter the First Baptist Church of Jefferson Town minutes before killing two black people in a grocery store nearby. In Pittsburgh, an anti-Semitic gunman targeted congregation members during services at the Tree of Life Synagogue. These are places of peace and worship that were invaded by violence and by hatred. The murder of 12 people in a Southern California country music bar last week brought the number of mass shootings in the U.S. to 307 this year, according to USA Today. The Thousand Oaks shooting happened on the 311th day of the year. And the tragedies of this epidemic go far beyond the shootings that grab the headlines. Gun violence is an everyday reality in many neighborhoods around our nation. It steals lives from our families and communities, affecting innocent youth as they walk to and from school and as they gather with their friends. Over the past weekend alone in Chicago, for instance, three people were killed and 17 others were wounded by firearms just this weekend. This is a horrific crisis that spans public health, policy, law, and morality. Yet for far too long, firearm deaths have been understudied due to limits placed on research by Congress or administrative agencies. Thankfully, this may be beginning to change. With the support of the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, the University of Michigan is leading a partnership that involves 20 researchers at 12 universities and health systems across our nation. This will help address what University of Michigan physician Rebecca Cunningham calls a deficit of data-driven solutions by applying injury prevention science to reduce harm and deaths. At the same time, we must honor and bring attention to the young people in our nation's neighborhoods who are standing up and demanding change. Those who are ensuring that we do not forget the lives taken, 
and the community is forever saddened. Those who work tirelessly against violence and injustice and who carry forward the greatest qualities, Raoul Wallenberg. This year's Wallenberg medalists are two organizations whose members are taking life-saving action in our nation's communities. I'm honored to present the first medal of the evening to the Brave Youth Leaders Organization. Brave stands for Bold Resistance Against Violence Everywhere and is the Violence Prevention Youth Council of St. Sabina's Church in Chicago's Southside. Brave brings together youth aged 13 to 24 to promote peace and change. In July, Brave helped to lead a march against gun violence and for equal opportunity that shut down the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago. Here to accept the medal on behalf of Brave are Rihanna, uh, Rihanna Holman and Keyshawn Newman, and I invite them to come up and join me on stage. Oh my goodness. Rihanna is a 16-year-old junior at Gwendolyn Brooks College Prep in Chicago and a brave youth activist. She's become a national voice for the plight of young people who face gun violence every day in their communities. We can still tell our stories and we'll lead them through our communities until we get them to empathize, she said at an event at Chicago High School. We can put our shoes on their feet. We can show them that gun violence can happen to anyone this isn't just a black or brown issue, it's an American issue. Keyshawn. <laughs> Keyshawn is a student at Perspectives Charter School and a youth leader for Brave. His older brother was a bystander who died from nine gunshot wounds in Chicago. Keyshawn spoke on public radio after an Aspen Institute art exhibit on gun violence and compared the youth anti-gun movement to the protests that helped bring an end to the Vietnam War. We, we got sick of it. So since we got sick of it, we just made sure that no one else had to go through what we had to go through, he said. Seeing that youth ended war in history, that's what we're here to do right now. We're here to end this war that we have to deal with. So I'd like to thank Rihanna and Keyshawn and Brave for their leadership and offer them one more round of applause. John, shall we invite them to stay up here and have a seat? Have a seat. And then uh, our next medalist is the March for Our Lives organization which sprung from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas tragedy in Parkland, Florida. Students from the high school rallied our nation after an armed attacker killed 17 people in February. Working with youth leaders throughout the United States, the Parkland students have sought political action to prevent gun violence in our schools and churches, homes and neighborhoods. On March 24th, 2018, millions of people marched in Washington, D.C. and throughout the country launching a movement that continues 
a movement that continues to demand accountability from our elected leaders. Here to accept the Wallenberg Medal for March for Our Lives are Alex Wind and Sophie Whitney, and I invite them to come up on stage. Alex, Alex Wind is a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and a founding member of March for Our Lives. After the Parkland shooting, he posed a set of questions to the nation in an interview with the Washington Post. How are we supposed to feel safe again, he asked. How are we supposed to know and feel safe in those exact hallways where the shooting happened if nothing changes? If these laws caused the shooting in the first place, what's gonna stop another shooting if the laws don't change. <laughs> Sophie Whitney graduated this year from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and served as the director of social media for the March and the Summer Bus Tour, uh, The Road to Change. Uh, A few weeks after the shooting, she wrote an op-ed that appeared in Glamour magazine. Some adults are saying we're over-emotional and aren't thinking logically because of our experience, she wrote. That kind of doubt, especially coming from the older generations who we want to support us, is the last thing we need right now. Experiencing this kind of tragedy is exactly what makes us perfectly capable of fighting. So I'd like to thank Alex and Sophie and March for Our Lives for their leadership, and let's give them one more round of applause. Oh my God, okay, I'll just sit here. Coach Harbaugh, eat your heart out. <laughs> so I'd like to turn it back over to John Gottfried for a conversation with our Wallenberg okay. medalists. Oh, it is. Okay. Hey. This is going to be structured like a, just a, a living room conversation. So we're going to ask each of our medalists just to share thoughts about their experience and their ideas and their notions about the challenges that they see before them and uh, their ideas for change. Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Wind. I am currently a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, nine months ago today, was a shooting at my high school. And ever since that day, I have, you know, I've, I've had a lot of time, obviously, nine months. And what I see everywhere I go is hope. And what I think is most important for me to be here today to tell all of you is that you are the hope that I see. And I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight because it means you care. It means you care enough about gun violence to try and stop it. And that is what I think is the most important thing to be here today. We are here to stop gun violence today.
One thing that I do want to say is that I want to give you all a little job. When you go home, and it doesn't have to be today, just you know, this week, even if it's this month, and I want you to do this once a month, I want you to call your congressman, and I want you to call your senator, and I want you to call your governor and call your state reps, and I want you to say that you want gun violence prevention legislation to be passed because you're here today and you care. So we need to take the next step. And the next step is making sure that the people that we vote are actually representing our views. And we will not get anywhere unless we take that initiative, unless we actually pick up the phone, unless we actually pick up a pen and want to write a letter. You know, no one does that nowadays, but <laughs> they still accept them, so why not? <laughs> Something else that I think is really important is that, you know, what we see in this country nowadays is that we see a divide. You know, no matter what side you are on, there will be someone that has the complete opposite viewpoint of you. You need to talk to that person. You need to find the people that disagree with you. You need to get that relative. Thanksgiving's coming up soon. We all have that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need to make sure that your views are being shared with the world because your voice matters. And that's one thing that I think we can all say that we've learned from these experiences is that no matter what, is that after tragedy, we have been able to morph our voices into something that has mattered. But what we've noticed is, is that we always had this power. We always had this voice. And the fact that we weren't using it before was an injustice and a disservice. So we need to make sure that everyone is using their voices. We need to make sure that everyone is making their opinion known and making their opinion out there because it is 100% valid, especially to our elected officials because we are the people that vote them. We are the people that can vote them in, but more importantly, we can vote them out as well. And uh, another thing that I want to talk about is the difference between being proactive and being reactive. I was reactive. Before February 14th, I was aware of what was going on in the political system, but I was not informed as to why I should care and why it actually mattered to me. What I need for all of you to do is to make sure that you are so well informed on this issue and on any issue that you care about, and to not wait for something to happen to you to make you want to care about it. Because what happens is that you don't want to wait to see your brother. You don't want to wait to see your best friend, your parents, your children in a casket. You want to say, you know, you want to be able to have prevented that. I mean, look at Florida. We passed an extreme risk protection order law which states that a, a federal judge has the right to make sure that a person that is not eligible to buy a weapon to have, is not able to have that weapon. A, a doctor or a family member can go to a judge and say, I do not believe that this person should have this weapon because they are a threat to themselves or other. That law has saved thousands of lives right now. Because of, since, it, since it has been affected, it has been used over a thousand times to make sure that people have not gotten weapons. And the issue is, the issue is that over 60% of people, a super majority of people, believe that extreme risk protection orders should be a national law. Yet we do not have it on the books. 97%. I'll say that again, 97% of people believe that we need universal background checks, yet we do not have them. Why is that? The NRA. <laughs> and I don't know if you saw, but this midterm election, there were over 40 NRA-backed politicians that were voted out of office. <laughs> Thank you.
the NRA has been exposed to what they are. Finally, we see them in this light and that they are not the gun rights organization that they preach that they are. But what we need to do is that we need to make sure that we don't stop putting the pressure on them. We can't stop putting pressure on politicians and putting pressure on policymakers to demand a change. Because we can vote people in, that's great, but what happens when the next mass shooting happens? What happens when the next shooting happens? Is there going to be legislation passed? That is what I am focused on. I am focused on ensuring that legislation is passed in not only in the country, but in my state and in states all over, because I do not want to see another shooting in this country. I do not want to see people experiencing what the people on this stage have experienced, because no one should have to go through their lives thinking about where do I go in case a shooting happens? Where is the best place for me to hide? The other day, there was a lockdown at, at Fort Lauderdale Airport because uh, a suspicious package was sent there. But my mom was in Fort Lauderdale Airport at that time. My brother was at Fort Lauderdale Airport at that time. They didn't know what was happening, and, they, and it could have been a shooting. It could have been anything. We should not be afraid of being locked down somewhere, being afraid of our children going to school. We should not be afraid to send people to school. We should not be afraid to send people to grocery stores. We should not be afraid to go to a bar, to a nightclub, to a movie theater. We should not be living in fear due to gun violence in this country, and we need things to change. Hi, I'm Keyshawn. I'm 16 years old and I attend Perspective Charter School. On May, on May 2nd, 2016, my brother was shot nine times and killed due to him being in between a cross, crossfire. That day brought my family so much trauma, not just because of his death, but because of fear that another day my mother might lose another son because of the, where we live and the way that the conditions are right now. I wasn't gonna let my brother's name become a statistics, a statistic. It's not a number, it's his identity. He won't be a, just a regular kid that was shot on the, on the streets. I'm gonna make justice for his name. I'm gonna make sure that Everyone else that went through that can also get justice for their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their cousins, any family members that they've lost, just because of the way that our community has been raised because of the lack of resources that we have. I'm here to make justice because of the injustice that I see every single day of my life. Losing my brother, I didn't know what to do. I went through a lot of depression. I had one more brother with me, and I didn't want to lose him either. The day that I joined Brave, I believe it was October of last year, so I've been in Brave for a year now. They opened me with warm arms and pizza as well, which was a plus. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't forget that day, because that was the day that they gave me a voice to speak to speak out because I lost a loved one and I didn't want any other to lose a loved one as well. I do my best because I don't want anyone to go through the tragedy and the trauma that my family had to go through. It was a burden on all of us because my mom didn't want to have to send me outside to go to the store and I come back with blood on my chest or I don't come back at all. Or my brother goes out to college and we don't see him no more. I take the time to really understand that I'm doing this because I have a purpose in life. I got a second chance at life. I was hit by a bus and I almost lost my life because, you know, I had a lot of trauma to my body. And I was sick 
inside of my house for days thinking, why did the Lord give me a second chance? They gave me the purpose of life. They gave me a reason why I have that second chance, and I'm not going to waste that. I'm going to keep on fighting this fight that has to be fought. I'm going to make sure that nobody else has to go through this fight, especially not little kids that's a part of Baby Brave or Junior Brave. I'm going to make sure that nobody else has to go through that trauma. I'm going to make sure that nobody else has to experience everything that I've had to experience. I don't want another person on the news crying about losing a loved one or somebody that's in a hospital because someone's been wounded from a gunshot or somebody has to be in fear because their family might be in danger because of gun violence or just in fear because they might lose a loved one that day. I grew up in a community where everyone had to walk around looking behind their backs, looking in front of them, making sure that they don't show anything that might influence or persuade someone to come up, rob them. I, I can't remember the kid's name, but I went to the park this day. This kid said that he couldn't be outside for so long because he was in danger. His family had been killed, multiple, a lot of his family members had been killed due to gun violence because of a family member that passed on a while ago was inside of gang violence. But everyone isn't in a gang. Everyone that's been shot and killed wasn't gang related inside of my community. I'm not going to sit and say that everyone inside of my community has influenced or have done something bad because of the color of their skin. I'm not going to say that because that's not the case. Everyone has just been living inside a community trying to love another, but they can't do that because they don't know who to love and who to fear. You can't fear everyone inside your life because you're going to be restricted and chained down. You're going to be fearful and be be limited to what you can and can't do. And I don't, I don't want to live my life like that. I don't want to live my life inside of my house thinking, if I go in this area, will I get shot? If I look and this guy looks at me back, is there going to be an altercation? And if I do speak to someone, will they speak back? Or will they look at me in fear because I'm just another teenager inside of my community that might try to rob them? It's a lot of things that bring fear inside of my community, and I'm here to stop. I'm here to stop the injustice. I'm tired. I'm tired of losing loved ones. I'm tired of fear inside of everyone's heart. I'm tired of people portraying a black man as a threat or portraying them as a gang member or saying that they were inside of that incident because they were inside of a gang or tired of someone being pulled over and shot because they thought they had a weapon when they was really trying to brush their hair. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm 18 and I graduated Stoneman Douglas last year. I just wanna thank everybody for coming and thank the Wallenberg Committee for giving young people the award in multiple organizations from different backgrounds, and I really hope this isn't the, the only time that will happen. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna tell you my experience and my story from that day to now. On February 14th, nine months ago today, uh, I was just like a normal high school student. I was in my drama classroom, we were pr practicing this really stupid show called Yo Vikings. Um, and we were in the, I just had, I had just gotten my phone taken away because I was a senior. Why are you taking my phone away? It doesn't matter. But <laughs> so we were, we were in the middle of rehearsal and the fire alarm goes off. And it's, it's strange because we had a fire drill in second period that day. So we kind of just like sat still for a second. And um, then, we, we just, our teacher is like, yeah, maybe we should actually go outside since the fire alarm has been, it isn't stopping, let's, let's go. And I, I take seven steps outside of the classroom and gunshots in my, in my school. And I was, we live in a very privileged community and a very, Parkland was voted the safest city in Florida for, I think, nine years. So 
I was, I was in denial, I was in shock. I obviously ran back in the classroom and in my head the entire time I was thinking, this isn't real, like this would never happen to us. This is, this is our school, like we go here every single day. It's not, this is, it's, I, was, I was in denial even though I heard exactly what it was. And after going home that day and watching the Facebook posts of missing students and people that haven't reconnected with their families yet. And it, it just, it was really, it was just like a really crappy feeling. Like it was just the worst case scenario. And we woke up the next day and we went to a vigil. More people than I've literally ever seen. I think the entire city of Parkland was there. And it's a lot of people. And it was just so sad. Like I've never experienced such sadness and and it was just, there was so much of it and we, we needed to do something. We were really mad because what, when things don't go, we're kids, when things don't go our way, we get really mad and we need to fix it. And when it's not immediate, we, we get even more mad. But we, we were just, it, it all kept coming back to this, this idea that how did this happen? Like how, how did a, a, a person like that get this kind of gun and, and get into our school and, and kill 17 people and injure 17 others. It just, it didn't, it didn't make sense because it shouldn't happen. So I'd say like about 20 of us on a living room floor of one of our friends' houses, we were brainstorming and doing media coverage and all of this weird stuff that we should never have to do and meeting with our politicians, our, our senator was in the house with us. Like None of this was supposed to happen, but it, it was like the perfect storm. We were all there together, and we all wanted the same thing, and we all wanted change. And on February 18th, which happens to be my birthday, so this was like kind of a good present, we announced the March for Our Lives. And at the time, I don't think any of us realized like the monumental thing that was coming our way, but we were like, oh, maybe 90 people will show up. <laughs> a little bit more than 90 people came. Um, yes. More than 90. <laughs> yes. So on March 24th, there were about um, like over 800 marches across the world. Like, and on every single continent, we're waiting to hear back about if Antarctica made it or not. But <laughs> I think that scientists marched. I like to think that. And um, about a, over a million people across the world, all united, no matter what color your skin is, what sexuality, what religion, like everyone was just united on this one cause that we need to end gun violence. It was, it was not, it wasn't, it's not a radical idea. One, this is a side story, but I was in Rhode Island for our book tour, and this, um, the Rhode Island um, Coalition Against Gun Violence, they said that their elected official called them a radical group. A radical group that literally just says they're against gun violence. I don't know what's radical about that. But, yes. <laughs> um, and on, um, on March 24th, as you all know, there was a march. And it, was, it started with Parkland, but we experienced one act of gun violence, and a lot of us probably will never experience something like that again. But we, we couldn't just have a march calling an end to mass shootings, because mass shootings, although they've been frequent in our country this year specifically, they are not the main cause of gun violence in this country. There's, gun suicides, there's everyday shootings in cities that are overwhelmingly underfunded, and there are, um, it's, there are domestic violence cases. So we, we knew we couldn't speak for everyone, so we got, our, we got our, some friends from Chicago. We got Pam's son, Trey, he <laughs> spoke at the march. We, have, we, we got a coalition of young people from all over because we wanted to make sure we had a full full scope of the actual um, the terror that it really brings to our country. And I think that day, it, it, what it means to me at least is that it was a day where young people everywhere, they, they realized the power that their voice had because I know that, that they always had it and we always had this power, but it was really just a day where we realized that 
the longer we keep quiet and the longer we don't have a platform to speak about issues affecting us, the more of us that are gonna die and the more of us that are gonna be like very strongly affected by, by bad policies in this country. And everyone was saying after the march, like, what's next? Like, hold on, give us a second. We're, we've been planning, <laughs> we only had a month and it didn't happen. But we wanted to do something where we could connect with um, all of the people that had mobilized. Because there were a lot of people, young people that told us that they had never been involved with something like this, but once they saw us speaking out that they, they started their own groups and that's what we wanted, that was our next step. We wanted to go to these places and we wanted to have conversations and we wanted to make sure that like people, because a lot, the big problem with the way that we were painted in the media and how the, the entire March for Our Lives was, was that we were some like radical gun grabbing group of kids. I don't know, I don't, I, what? That's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not true. So we, we knew that that, barrier could be broken once we had these conversations and that was kind of where the road to change was born which was our our summer bus tour we had two of them actually one national one all over florida every congressional district and it was just about engaging with communities face to face and showing that we are normal people and we're all fighting the same battle and i think the most like my favorite takeaway from the road to change was the fact that when we went to cities, we would take people that we met and, peop and organizers that we had become close with and we brought them with us. Because it's really easy to, to hear, okay, maybe not easy, okay. It's, it's really easy for all of like the, us Parkland students, we were all together and, it, and everybody knows our story because we were lucky enough to have a platform to speak about it, but there are so many people affected by gun violence every, every day that don't have that platform. And I can tell you, like, listening to Rihanna and, and I'm sorry, I'm Keyshawn. really nervous, Keyshawn, I, I, I blacked out. Keyshawn and Rihanna speak today, just, I've, I've heard them speak, but just every, it's so much more powerful when you hear a story that you've never heard before from people that are experiencing this every single day. And I think that's the beauty of March for Our Lives, that's that it started in Parkland, but it's so much more. It's... It's, it's Chicago, it's Oakland, it's Baltimore, it's DC, it's, it's everywhere. And, and there's, we have chapters across the country now and it's just, it's amazing to see that everyone is realizing now like change making doesn't have an age limit. And as long as you're passionate about something and as long as you truly believe that you're doing the right thing, then any, quite literally anything is possible because I know that nine months ago, I didn't think that I would be able to First of all, I didn't read anything. Like I just spoke for that long and didn't even look at a script and that's a big accomplishment <laughs> for me. But like, oh my God, stop. It's like, it's just once you realize the power that your voice has, it's, the possibilities are absolutely infinite. So please like actively, everyone in this room, actively try and make the world a better place. And I know, and coming here is a start, but you need to be having conversations, you need to be active in your community, you need to engage. There are gun violence prevention groups everywhere. And that is, that is the work, that's the next step for everyone. So thanks for listening to me ramble. Hello everyone. Hey. So I'm gonna do this quick exercise, okay? So everybody repeat after me. Everyday shootings. Everyday, everyday shootings. Our everyday problems. Our, our everyday, everyday problems. problems. Everyday shootings. Everyday shootings. Our everyday problems. Our everyday, everyday problems. problems. So this was said by Trevon <laughs> Bosley at the March for Our Lives event, and since then it's been a national saying. So my name is Rihanna Holman. I attend Gwendolyn Brooks College Prep on the south side of Chicago. I am 16 years old and I am a part of the Brave Youth Leaders Organization. Woo! Yes. I love my high school friends over there. Yeah. So I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, but let's <laughs> see. 
Um, so I, I've, my first Brave meeting um, was last summer. I was in an um, after school matters program that was at St. Sabina Academy. And Lamar Johnson was the overseer of the program. And Father Michael Flager, the pastor of St. Sabina, came and spoke to all of the, the kids that were working there. He said, at least 30 of you all, it was about 60 of us, at least 30 of you all have to join Brave. Like, there's no question about it. If you don't join Brave, you're not getting paid. So I was <laughs> like, I'm going to join Brave. <laughs> But that's not the main reason why I joined Brave. So my brother is an OG Brave member, they call themselves. That's College Brave. They are the founding members of Brave. So Brave, at first, was not an organization. It was a networking thing, Majibit. And <laughs> it became an organization. A bunch of Trevon Bosley, my brother, Jessica, they all got kids from their colleges to join Brave, and that's how Brave was kind of founded. So being a part of Brave, adding on to what Keyshawn said, it's a different, not even, it's like a different type of environment. Like they welcome you with open arms, it's food there, it's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. So the first Brave, I feel, I feel like, let me see if I remember, my first Brave meeting, I feel like I walked in and everybody was like so comforting, but it wasn't even the fact they were comforting, it's like they were so open with everybody. They were, tell, like, they were telling their stories, like what they've been through, their um, experiences with gun violence and, how, and like, how they came into Brave and like, why they're here. So the reason why I'm here today is because I am tired of the gun violence and all of the epidemic health issues that's happening around America and in Chicago. Yeah, and in Chicago mostly, because I live in Chicago. So, yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So. I wasn't done. So I've got. You weren't done. I wasn't done. Roll with it. She's got more. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so a big reason why I'm here today is because I think it's important that everyone. Uh, like knows what's going on in Chicago and like a mass shootings that's happening every day, but nobody knows the like the everyday street shootings that's happening in Chicago. There have been over 300 mass shootings this year alone. But in Chicago, there have been 300 plus people killed alone. Can you imagine that? Living in a in a in a city where you're losing members, family members, friends every single day babies every single day. So the end of my sophomore year, I, my bus got caught in the middle of gunfire. It was like my bus was in the middle of a, a shooting that happened. And, oh, okay. It wasn't much of the fact that I almost like lost my life in about three to four seconds. It was the fact that there were so many young people on that bus that morning, seven o'clock in the morning. And there were so many young people crying. And that's all I remember. I still hear their screams in my head to this day. And it was in June. So that's a traumatizing event that happened to me. It's traumatizing. And I, still, I can still hear the gunshots in my head. And now when I'm on the bus to school, I'm on the, I still take the same bus. And when I'm on my way to school, if I hear like a loud bang, I'll, I'll automatically want to jump right to the floor because that's how traumatizing it was for me. Recently, my best friend Kirsten, who's also a Brave member, um, she came to a Brave meeting and she told us that a girl in her school, she goes to Oak Lawn, and a girl in her school bought a gun to school with a kill list. She wanted to kill all the cheerleaders on her cheerleading team because they were bullying her. The next day, that girl was right back in school. My, my friend Kirsten, she was so scared because the staff, like the principal wouldn't do anything about it. There's evidence. They found the kill list. They found everything. They didn't do nothing about it because she was bullied. Yes, she was bullied, and I understand that they, they need to, you know, fix that problem. But would you kill somebody because they was bullying you? 
So those are two different problems that's going on in the world. Gun violence and the access, like, she's a freshman. What is she doing with the gun in the first place? And then bullying is a huge problem, too. Bullying leads to the shootings, to suicide, so many different things. So there's a lot of problems that relate to gun violence, but the small problems are what cause it. The poverty. Chicago, the south and west side of Chicago, lack resources, lack funding. And across, uh, this, throughout this year, BRAVE has been getting a lot of donations, and we appreciate it very much. But I think it's important that we keep it going because if, we, if it wasn't for those donations that, we, that we've been getting, we wouldn't be here right now because our funding gets cut because violence prevention organizations are not essential. They're not important. And that's a big problem because we're fighting for people our ages, people younger than us, and nobody takes that into consideration. So I'm here today to make sure everybody here, if you've been through something, even if it wasn't a shooting or anything, if you've been through something that traumatizes you, that bothers you, get out there and like voice your opinion, tell your story. After, my, after that shooting on my bus happened, the next day I had an interview with the news channel, and that's exactly what I talked about. I didn't answer none of those questions. I was like, let me get this off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to thank our medalists, but we do have some questions from the audience, and I think the first one is pretty significant. It's, uh, how, what, do you, what do you want adults uh, to do to help you? And what's your experience in working with adults? Uh, you were the ones who were organizing. You were the ones who were taking the lead. Um, talk with us a little bit about your interaction with adults around these issues. So I think that what is really important is that there's no manual to activism. So what I mean by that is sort of, you know, both of our organizations were just sort of started in a way where, you know, we knew what we wanted to do and we knew that we wanted to do something, but we sort of didn't know how we were going to do it yet. And we needed to get the yet part out of the way. <laughs> What I think that a lot of adults can do to help is support. Support, support, support the youth. But you need to sort of understand what we mean by support. <laughs> what I think is really important is that, you know, these two organizations are youth-led, 100% youth-led. And, and what it means by that is that without the youth, these organizations would not exist. So what I think is really important for adults is that if you know people that, if you know young people that, you know, want your help on something or, you know, or, or you want, or want you to advise them, I think that what is most important is that to let the, is to let the youth lead and let them take let them take the drive in, let them take the wheel, and then, you know, if you want to sit in the back seat, <laughs> it's perfectly you fine. can. <laughs> but, you know, just don't be too much of a back seat driver, I think, is the biggest, you know, we just, we need your support. Because without it, you know, we, I, I can't book a hotel room yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we do need that support. But when we talk about, you know, what exactly, organization does and what exactly, you know, our plans are, that is 100% youth-led. Okay, I'll, I'd, oh, oh, well, you, oh. Uh, okay um, resources are really important because although we do have the right ideas and we do know how to implement them, a lot of the time when you're a young person, people don't like to, you can't really do a lot of, there are a lot of things that aren't accessible to us, and there are a lot of things that older people and the networking that you guys have done and the network and like 
the positions that you guys have can give us the resources and give local young people the resources like like them over there. They're amazing. Yeah. Like, you, you need to, is my mic even on? I don't know. But you need to find like local groups, local young people in their organizations and support them and provide them with help and funds and snacks. Like we need to eat because that's an important <laughs> thing. We always forget to eat. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's just all about understanding that that, that though we are like because I know that we wouldn't we'd be, we would be nowhere without adults because I mean obviously we were born from them but you know what I mean? <laughs> like we we've gotten a lot of support and a lot of help and we wouldn't have been able to plan a national march without a, it's not like we could do that on our own it's just important to know your place and, and now I, I know that sounds mean, but important to know that, that this is, it's youth led for a reason and young people's voices have been neglected for so long and it's, it's just important to elevate our voices and not mess with them, if you know what I mean. Thank you. But keep showing. I will actually, they had great points. I just wanted to add a little bit more on to it. When we say support, we mean like help. Help us get a platform to voice ourselves. We, we also need help to like teach us. We're not born knowing every single thing about legislations or how to better advocate inside of our communities. So take the time, help, help us educate ourselves so we can know what we're fighting for and also support us in the things that we're doing, like give us ideas. We can bounce something off of you. You can tell us if it's you know, right, wrong, if it's rational, if it's just some childish idea that you thought. Just give us some type of insight about what an adult mind can have. It's a lot of different things that you can help support us with. Just be the ones that help us instead of our act to make justice for this injustice. And you can always go out there and vote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in planning this event, we discovered uh, the uh, that um, email was not the way to reach you, <laughs> and uh, this speaks to a generational divide, I guess. Got it, Omar. Uh, but I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about the impact of social media on your lives around these issues. Uh, how you use it as, have used it as a mobilizing tool. And then also, how do you deal with the, with the wash of negativity that comes through these channels? Well, um, I know for a fact that March for Our Lives wouldn't exist if social media wasn't a thing. And that's what definitely differ, like, is the difference between Parkland and a lot of other mass shootings and a lot of other school shootings is that there wasn't really a, a platform for people to speak that were affected by this. And I think we used it as our greatest tool because no one, you can't edit our tweets and you can't edit the things that we put out ourselves. And that was a really, it was really useful. And I know the day, I think it was February 16th, we, we thought it was like this great idea to, to get hashtag never again trending. So we were like, everyone, tell your friends to post it and hashtag never again, it's, it's gonna be so crazy. And honestly, it was. Like, we were not, we trended number two under God's plan by Drake. <laughs> and it was just the idea that our, our messages, our message wasn't construed by any media and they couldn't cut out certain things that we were saying because it was, it was coming straight from us. And it was, it was kind of just like our access point to the entire world just from our phones. And we, we were lucky to have that platform and we've been using it for good and we've been screaming about politics every single day on our Twitters. And I know you guys do it on Facebook too, so. But um, it's, it's, it's definitely like our strongest tool but also one of our, big, it's definitely been something that has been used against us a lot. And it's, it's a very easy way for people to attack us. But when there are grown men attacking us on Twitter, you know they have no argument because they're literally, they're bullying children. <laughs> they're literally bullying teenagers. 
and, one, and once you get to the point where there's a, a middle-aged man bullying you online, you know they have no <laughs> argument and that you've won. So don't even, we don't even waste time on them. Anyone else? So social media also can be an outlet for us to inform people about the things that's coming up and that we're doing so they can become active just as active we are. So if we're marching, we can put on social media like, y'all come over real quick, we got to have a march, have a good time, you might have <laughs> some food, you might <laughs> you have a great time. So it's a, it's a great way to get things out there for people to be active in and participate inside of the things that we're doing so that they can learn more about the causes that we have so they can join a fight because more numbers is more efficient than About how did you with uh, neg you know, negativity, criticism, ass assaults that come over social media that you receive? Ooh. And also how social media helps. Mm. Mm. The question. So, so. <laughs> no, okay. Oh, All right. So I have uh, there's another question, and, and this is this is important because you know you come from very different worlds, and uh, I, I would like you to ask this is a question from the audience. What was the, the hardest thing, the single most hardest thing that you faced in organizing? Being hurt. Oh, I say that because Brave has been going since 2009, and we still are building our platform. We still haven't gotten on the stage yet. And people listen to us when we're shutting down the Darren Ryan Expressway, but when we're marching on streets every Friday during the summertime, they look at us like we're crazy. They only pay attention to us when something, when we're doing something huge. They don't pay attention to the small things that we do, the little events that we do, like the Safe Saturday events, the I Care Month events. Just getting the young people off the streets, they don't care about that. So I say being heard is a big challenge for us because they don't listen to a bunch of black kids that are advocating for their city. They say, they say we're just a bunch of angry kids that are are just mad and like ghetto. But when it's, um, but Parkland, they're passionate about their they're passionate about their movement and what they're doing. But the, so but media, they look at us and we're just angry black kids. So. Also say keeping our stories, our stories. You can say a lot of things on on the news, and they'll cut it out and make it into something that's more appealing to the eye and the ear to, of the listeners. But you have to really find that one media that's gonna actually let you tell your story how it was actually supposed to be told. Don't have no sound bites to your story. Don't have nobody rephrase what you said so it sounds more more appealing or better for people to listen to to make somebody want to look onto your site or catch somebody's eye. Make sure that you tell your story and don't let nobody ever change it. I think that the, the, the worst thing that I see is um, politicians' response and what I think is, you know, what I think is really bad is that politicians don't seem to care about their constituents' lives. And it's really sad. You know, I, I was able to go to D.C. two weeks after the shooting at our school, and I cannot tell you the number of times when we had to enforce a no cameras policy in our meetings. We wanted to make sure that these meetings were not just photo ops. We wanted to make sure that they were listening to us as people that had just survived gun violence. And, and you know, 
what the worst thing for me is is that we sit there in these meetings and they say, and politicians say, well, there isn't enough research about what solutions work. Well, you have the power to fund that research. I, I had the opportunity to be in a meeting with Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House. And, and I sat there and I looked him in the eye and I said, I know that you do not want law-abiding citizens to lose their guns. I don't want that either. However, the shooter in Las Vegas was a law-abiding citizen. So how do we make sure that he does not do that crime with the weapon? How do we make sure that that doesn't happen? And he said, I don't know the answer to your question. He is a person that is supposed to have the answers. Even if it wasn't a good answer, he could have said something to me. But he said, I don't have an answer to your question. And what I think people are starting to notice, constituents are starting to see, is that, you know, our voices, our votes, really do have an effect. Over 40 politicians backed by the NRA lost. That is the biggest number. That is the biggest number that we've seen in the, I don't remember what number it is, but I think it was past like 20 years or something like that. Ever. Or ever it might be, I don't know. But you know, what I think is most important really is that in every time that you know, we felt that a politician, you know, didn't give us a good answer, or that, you know, they knocked us down a peg or anything like that. We just bounced back twice as hard. You know, we went right next door and knocked on it and said, hey, over, over here, he doesn't have an answer. Do you? No? Okay. Over here. Do you have an answer? No? All right. See, see you in November, pretty much. <laughs> and that's all we got to do. We have to keep doing it. We have to keep putting the pressure on them. I thought of an answer. Um... The hardest thing for me to see is not the people that are against us and are, are really passionate about the Second Amendment and their gun rights, and it's the people that don't seem to care. It's, it's so much harder to convince somebody of, that, that already knows a lot about guns and, and is informed to, to agree with our policies because when, once you actually have those conversations, it's, it's, actu it's so much common sense. It's the people that, that don't give you the time of day and the people that look at their phones and see that there's another shooting and they, they don't care. That's the hardest thing for me to see. And I really think that this past year and our political climate in general is changing and I feel like a lot of people are developing a stronger empathy for, for tragedies and for violence in general, but it's really hard to see people that don't care. So the four of you have been working um, um, nearly nonstop on this issue, in addition to being students and the other things that crowd your busy lives. Um, so this is an important question. What do you do for fun? <laughs> sleep. <laughs> I haven't got any sleep. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to, I don't want to say it's hard to have fun. <laughs> because there are, there are times when you know, we have fun. But what I find is most important is just to take every day as it goes by and pretty much, you know, we have, a, we have a tendency as people to, you know, plan our entire futures out, plan our entire lives out, and just, you know, we don't, we, we don't like to let things interfere with us. We don't, we don't like roadblocks at all. We just like to veer on our path and keep going straight. But, you know, sometimes things happen that really make you wake up and say, wow, who cares about what happens five years from now? I could have died today. And what I think is most important is just to take every day as it comes, take every moment as it comes, and really just live as people. And that is something that we have strayed away from, I think, is that we're just forgetting how to live life. And I don't know how we fix that, 
And I know the question was about having fun. <laughs> and I veered off course a little bit. A little bit. Um, okay. I like to listen to music to have fun. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really important with the work. That I know the, both of our organizations, we are definitely like a family. Like, I could not do this work if I wasn't surrounded by the people I love and my friends and, I mean, Alex and I have been friends since we were like 10. So it's, it's, it's so much easier and, and less stressful when you're doing work with people that, that you know care about you and are looking out for your best interest. And it's, it's fun because obviously it's not the most fun topic. Obviously gun violence prevention isn't something that we enjoy talking about, but, but when we're engaging young, with young people and we're doing it together with our friends, like, it, it, it definitely could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> that was, whatever. You guys? So I'm gonna break down my, my week schedule, okay? <laughs> Please. So of course I have school every day of the week. On Mondays, I have Brave. On Tuesdays, after school, I have math tutoring. <laughs> On Wednesdays, I volunteer at my, my, um, my auntie's job. I volunteer with kids. I help them with their homework and stuff like that. On Thursdays, I have Brave. After Brave on Thursdays, I have a mentoring program I have to go, through, go to. On Fridays, I have a domestic violence class. And then after that domestic violence class, I have mentoring again. On Saturday, I have a ton of homework to do, tests to study for. On Sunday, I have church. So <laughs> that's the one. That's <laughs> with Father Flager. Yeah, and that's three out, four hours right there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have no fun. Not even that. <laughs> the best thing I can do in my week is sleep. <laughs> that's what I do. Well, my schedule throughout the week. <laughs> um, so Monday, I have Impact Team, which I'm a, I'm a helper there. So I help, like, whenever he can't make it, I help teach the class. Then after that, I have to go to weightlifting. And from weightlifting, I have to hurry up, grab my stuff, and run to Brave, because we have meetings Mondays now. Uh, <laughs> Tuesdays, I have um, what's, Junior TMZ, which is supposed to be just an additional thing that I picked up and also weightlifting right after that. <laughs> then I go home, got to take care of two dogs and a cat. <laughs> and soon it will be a ferret that's adding on to that. So yeah. Wow. Wednesday, I'm, uh, I have my student government meetings because I'm president of student government. So. <laughs> <laughs> so first I have to sit through the meeting, the general meeting with everyone. Then I have to sit there for actual, 30 minutes just talking with the teacher about everything that we just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> then still have to go home to do two dogs, a cat, and soon a fairy. <laughs> and Thursdays I have Brave and also Junior TMZ. That's why I'm a little, brave, a little late to Brave, just a little. And again, got to go home, two dogs, a cat, and soon a fairy. Oh then Friday is more of a chill day. I get out at 1.30 from school because my, my school knows the struggle of going through all five days with full schedules. <laughs> and then about five, five o'clock, what time is the meeting for domestic violence training? Five. It doesn't matter what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> They're not coming to you. <laughs> so I have that. And then on weekends is additional work for planning my, uh, me becoming a mentor or just going through events. And hopefully I can just sit down on my phone and watch me a few movies <laughs> before I got to take care of the two dogs, cat. <laughs> that was wonderful. So, on behalf of the University of Michigan's Wallenberg Committee, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank Rihanna. Right.
and Sophie and Kishan and Alex for being with us tonight. I also want to thank and acknowledge Pamela Bosley and Lamar yeah. Johnson Woo! Who are with us tonight for their inspiration and their commitment to ending gun violence in the schools and communities of Chicago. I also want to mention our American Sign Language translators who've been working assiduously at the side of the stage. For Bonnie Schultz and Jeremy Wakeman. And I want to particularly acknowledge Kaya Dubai and her colleagues who've done an extraordinary job in preparing this evening for all of us. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you and good night. Oh, you need me?